The Bible is filled with amazing scientific facts that will blow your mind. Here are 20 of those mind blowers. Number one, the Bible and its free float in space. At a time when some believed that the Earth sat on the back of a large animal, 1500 BC, the Bible spoke of the Earth's free float in space. Quote, he hangs the Earth on nothing. Science didn't discover that the Earth hangs on nothing until 1650. Number two, the scriptures speak of an invisible structure. Only in recent years has science discovered that everything we see is composed of things that we cannot see, invisible atoms. In Hebrews 11 verse 3, written 2,000 years ago, scripture tells us that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Number three, the Bible and the science of oceanography. Matthew Murray, born in 1806, is considered the father of oceanography. He noticed the expression, paths of the sea, in Psalm 8 verse 8, written 2,800 years ago, and said, if God says there are paths in the sea, I'm going to find them. Murray then took God at his word and went looking for those paths. And we are indebted to his discovery of the warm and cold continental currents. His vital book on oceanography is still in print today. Number four, the Bible and radio waves. God asked Job a very strange question in 1500 BC. He asked, can you send out lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. This appears to be a scientifically ludicrous statement that light can be sent and then manifest itself in speech. But did you know that all electric magnetic radiation from radio waves to X-rays travels at the speed of light? This is why you can have an instantaneous wireless communication with someone on the other side of the world. The fact that light could be sent and then manifest itself in speech wasn't discovered by science until 1864. Number five, the Bible and entropy. Three different places in the Bible indicate that the earth is wearing out like a garment. This is what the second law of thermodynamics, the law of increasing entropy, states. That in all physical processes, every ordered system over time tends to become more disordered. This wasn't discovered by science until recently, but the Bible states it in concise terms. Number six. Nearly 3,000 years ago, the book of Job in Job 38.22 asked the question, Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? It wasn't until the advent of the microscope that we understood that every snowflake is both unique and beautiful. Number seven. Modern deep sea cameras have discovered amazing springs on the bottom of the ocean. These great springs of water release vast amounts of mineral rich superheated water. The Bible in the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 16, written nearly 3,000 years ago, speaks of the springs of the sea. Number eight. Do you know that the Bible speaks of a huge animal that seems to be the dinosaur? Here are all the given characteristics of this huge animal. It was the largest of all the creatures that God had made, was plant-eating, had tremendous strength in its hips, and a tail like a large tree. It had bones strong as bronze and iron, lived among the trees, drank massive amounts of water, and was not disturbed by a raging river. This is written in the book of Job, chapter 40, verses 15 to 24, written nearly 3,000 years BC. Number nine. The Bible instructs that male babies are to be circumcised on the eighth day according to Genesis 17 verse 12. Medical science has now discovered that this is the day that the coagulating factor in the blood is at its highest. It reaches its peak on the eighth day, then drops. Medical science has also discovered that this is when the human body's immune system is at its peak. Number 10. Modern science has come to understand that there is a strong relationship between a person's mental and physical health. The Bible revealed this to us with statements and others written around 950 BC. Proverbs 14 verse 30, a sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the bones. Proverbs 15 verse 30, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and a good report makes the bones healthy. These and many other amazing facts are in a book that I've written called Scientific Facts in the Bible. And by the way, we're giving away hundreds of thousands of copies of another exciting evangelistic book, completely free and no charge for shipping. Find out more at the end of this video.
Number 11. Long before medical science discovered the importance of quarantining persons with infectious diseases, the Bible instructed it. In 1490 BC, the scriptures tell the people of Israel what to do if someone has a skin condition like leprosy. He is unclean, he shall dwell alone, without the camp shall his habitation be. Leviticus 13.46 laws of quarantine were not instigated by modern man until the 17th century. Number 12. Science expresses the universe in five terms. Time, space, matter, power and motion. Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 perfectly revealed such truths to the Hebrews back in 1450 BC. Quote, in the beginning, time, God created power, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. The Spirit of God was hovering, that is motion, over the face of the waters. Number 13. Plants need sunlight, water and minerals in order to grow and to make their own energy and food. If plants do not get sunlight and yet have water and minerals, they cannot produce chlorophyll. They will then die. It's interesting to note, therefore, the chronological order of the Genesis creation. God created light first, Genesis 1 verse 3, and then he created water, verse 6, and then soil, verse 9, and then he created plant life, verse 11. Number 14. The scriptures tell us that the second coming of Jesus Christ, which will happen at the speed of light according to Luke 17, 24, will occur while some are asleep at night and others are working at daytime activities in the field. This is a clear indication of a revolving earth with day and night at the same time. Science didn't discover this until the 15th century. Number 15. In speaking of the sun, the psalmist written 800 years BC said, its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Psalm 19 verse 6. For many years, critics scoffed at this verse, claiming that it taught the doctrine of geocentricity that is, the sun revolves around the earth. Scientists at the time thought the sun was stationary. However, it's been discovered in recent years that the sun is in fact moving through space at approximately 600,000 miles per hour. It's traveling through the heavens and has a circuit, just as the Bible says. Number 16. At least seven times in scripture we're told that God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Isaiah 40 verse 22. It wasn't until the 1920s that astronomers observed evidence that the galaxies are moving away from each other, indicating the entire universe is expanding or stretching out, a fact that the Bible spoke of thousands of years earlier. Number 17. In Jeremiah 33 22, the Bible states that, quote, the host of the heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. When it was written 2,500 years ago, no one knew how vast the stars were, as fewer than 1,100 were visible. Now we know that there are billions of stars and that they cannot be numbered. Number 18. God created the lights in the heavens, quote, for signs and seasons and for days and years, according to Genesis 1.14. Through the marvels of astronomy, we now understand that a year is the time required for the Earth to travel around the Sun. The seasons are caused by the changing position of the Earth in relation to the Sun. Number 19. Look at the specific instruction God gave thousands of years ago to His people for when they encountered disease. Quote, and when he who has a discharge is cleansed from his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. Leviticus 15 verse 13. Until recent years, doctors washed their hands in a bowl of water, leaving invisible germs on their hands. However, the Bible says specifically to wash under running water. And number 20. Researchers suggest that virtually all modern men, 99% of them, are closely related genetically and share genes with one male ancestor, dubbed Y-chromosome Adam. It's been passed down the line from father to son over thousands of generations, and ultimately traces back to one man, call him Scientific Adam. 
The DNA comes from special cell structures called mitochondria. These trace back to one woman. Call her Scientific Eve. Just as the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1. Do you trust the Bible? Do you believe it's God's word? Yes, but I feel like it's like the game telephone. You tell one person something and then it goes down the line. I grew up in a religious household. What's religious? What do you mean by that? In a Christian household. Family Christians? Yes, sir. I would say I'm in the middle with everything. In the middle? Yes. What about you? Do you think there's an afterlife? Yeah, I think there's an afterlife. Why? Uh, I grew up Catholic, and I mean, like, not heavy Catholic, but I do believe in God and heaven and hell, yeah. Do you ever read the Bible? Uh, no, I, I don't often. Do you believe in God? Yes. Why would he give us death? You're born and then you die. Do you ever read the Bible? Yeah. It tells you why. Like, I haven't read it in a while, but, like, uh, yeah. Do you trust the Bible? Do you believe it's God's word? Yes, but I feel like it's like the game telephone. You tell one person something, and then it goes down the line, and then in the end, it's not the same exact message. It's altered. It's different. Do you know how to fix that? I don't think you really can. Yeah, the person who gave the message follows the message so it doesn't change. And that's exactly what God's done with his word. It hasn't changed. I've been reading the Bible every day for 50 years without fail, and it hasn't changed. It's just the same. <laughs> All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. So you can trust it. But there is a way, a scientific way, that you know you can trust it. You know what that is? No. The Bible's full of prophecy and scientific facts. Do you know the Bible has scientific facts? written thousands of years before man discovered them, the principles of oceanography, the hydrological cycle. The Bible mentions those before man discovered them. It speaks of the earth's free float in space. It says the earth hangs upon nothing. The earth hangs on nothing. The Bible says it. It speaks of the circle of the earth, the earth being spherical. That shows the fingerprint of God all over his word. It shows you can trust it because only God knows the future and only God knows the scientific facts. Make sure you watch this video to the end for our biggest ever giveaway. Free stuff with free shipping. No kidding. You're going to love it. Old Testament God promised to destroy death. The New Testament tells us how he did it. Did you know that? No, I did not. But you can trust God's word. The reason I say that is because the Bible tells you you can find everlasting life. It tells us what causes death and tells us how to find the answer. Can you guys be honest with me? Yes. Of yes. Yes. Of when did you last look at pornography? It's been like a year. About a year? No, like four days ago. Are you doing anything you know that God would morally frown upon? Possibly, yeah. yeah. And what about you? When did you last look at porn? Um, well, yeah, I also have a girlfriend, so I don't really... You having sex outside of marriage? Yeah. You know, the Bible says fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, whoever looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Ever heard that? Yeah, I have heard that. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. In other words, God is paying you in death for your sins. Like a judge looks at a murderer who's killed three women. He says, you've earned the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. And sin is so serious to a holy God He's given you the death sentence. Your death will be evidence that God is deadly serious about sin. So here's the big question, Angie. Do you believe you're evil enough for God to be justified to put you to death for your sins? Everyone has done sin like before. like Such as? Um, lying and stealing? Like lying and stealing. I was going to say something else. I just don't remember how to translate it to English. Where I've fought with my parents before, like verbally fought. and you feel uh, guilty after that? Yeah. Because yeah. God's law is written upon our heart. So let's look at the other commandments. How many lies have you told in your life? Too many. Yeah, same answer. Yeah. Ever yeah. stolen something? I have. No. Yeah. What about you? Of course. Ever used God's name in vain? Of course. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. That's called blasphemy. So serious, it's punishable by death in the Old Testament. So, do you think God is happy with you or angry at you? Uh, probably angry. Yeah. Uh, furious. Furious. The Bible says his wrath actually abides upon you. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah. The Bible says he that believes on the Son has everlasting life. He that believes not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides upon him. The scriptures call us the children of wrath, children of disobedience. So guys, here's a summation of your little court case on Judgment Day. All three of you, except you who haven't admitted to theft, have said that you're lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterous at heart.
if God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, are you going to be innocent or guilty? Oh, guilty. Uh, guilty, I guess. You don't have to guess. You'll be guilty. Lying, thieving. Well, if we're going, if we're going by that rule, then yeah. Yeah, guilty. you'd be guilty. So, heaven or hell? Uh, hell if we're going by that rule. Yeah. What about you? I'm going to hell. Well, if we're going by that, who wouldn't be going to hell? Yeah, the Bible says God's wrath abides on every single person, and if you die in your sins, but you'll end up in hell. So hear a but. What's the but? The, 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 beauty, the beauty of it is it's not too late, and it's never too late. There's always room for improvement. And Well, hang on a minute. What say someone dies in their sins? It's too late. Isn't that true? That is true. Jesus right? spoke of a man who, who wasn't rich towards God. He wanted to build bigger barns to put his goods in, and Jesus said, God said to that man, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Guys, if you're going to jump out of a plane 10,000 feet, why would you put on a parachute? Uh, to survive. Yeah, and what's your motivation for putting the parachute on? Do you know? It's one of fear. You don't want to hit the ground at 120 miles an hour on your face. That fear is your friend, not your enemy, because it's making you put on a parachute. And guys, because I love you, I've tried to put the fear of God in you today. I've tried to make you sweat, hoping you'll see that fear is your friend, not your enemy because it'll drive you to God's mercy where you'll find everlasting life. Okay, let's start with you. What did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Jesus. What did he do? He sacrificed his only son. So how does that help me 2,000 years later? Do you know? It shows us faith and not to, to learn from our mistakes. No. Yeah. Let me try and explain it and I'll get your thoughts after I explain it, okay? Guys, this will change everything for you if you can get a grip of it. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. That's why he said it is finished just before he died. He was saying paid in full. If you're in court and you've got speeding fines and someone else pays them, a judge will let you go even though you're guilty. You say you're guilty, but you can go. Someone paid this fine. And even though you and I are guilty before God of serious crimes that justify us being damned in hell, he can take the death sentence off us. He can let us walk because Jesus paid the fine in his life's blood. And then he rose from the dead and defeated death. Do you remember what death is according to the Bible? No. Have you ever heard the Bible verse, the wages of sin is death? Yes. Have you heard that? No, I have not. Have you heard that? Yes. Boy, the Catholic Church owes you an apology. It should tell you these things. Death is wages. In other words, God is paying you in death for your sins. Like a judge looks at a heinous criminal that's murdered three women, he says, you've earned the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. This is what we're paying you. And sin is so serious in the eyes of a holy God, he's given you the death sentence. You're on capital punishment. Your death will be evidence to you that God is deadly serious about your sins. And yet the Bible says he's rich in mercy, provided a savior. And if you'll simply repent of your sins, do you know what repentance is? Yes. What is it? It's basically making up for it. No, that's penance. Then I'm not sure. Do you know what repentance is? Is it like owning them and admitting to them? Yeah, well, it's, it's turning from sin. You confess and forsake your sin. You don't say, I'm a Christian, but you fornicate and lie and steal and blaspheme. That's playing the hypocrite. You've got to be genuine in your faith. So if you repent and put your trust in Christ, like a trust a parachute, the moment you do that, you've got God's promise. He'll forgive every sin you've ever committed and grant you everlasting life as a free gift, not because you're good, but because he's good and kind and rich in mercy. That's called grace. And the Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. Is this making sense? Yeah, it is. Is this making sense to you? Yeah. When are you gonna repent and trust in Christ? I don't know because I don't think it's that simple. Yeah, it really is. It's like putting a parachute on. If you're on a plane 10,000 feet up and I say to you, you're gonna put your parachute on before you jump and you say, I really don't think it's that simple. Best thing I can do is hang you out the plane by your ankles for two seconds. You'll come in and say, give me that parachute. This is simple. Let me put it on. I'm going to put my trust in it. And as I said, because I love you, I've tried to hang you out eternity by your ankles today. Make you a little fearful. So you see, there's a sense of urgency. What will stop you coming to Christ, receiving God's forgiveness? Do you know what would do that? Uh, living in the flesh. Yeah, it's your love of sin. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light. At the moment, you're thinking... Yikes, no more sex with my girlfriend, no messing around sexually with her. And you're weighing it up, but God gave you sex as a gift. You've got the apparatus, so is she. It's not evolution that did that, it's God's gift to you. But it's within the confines of marriage. If someone gives you a brand new car like your dad and he says, Son, 
I give this on the condition that you stay on the right side of the road and don't drink and drive. If you drink and drive and drive on the wrong side of the road, he's got the right to take the keys back. And you don't want God to take his keys of life back from you. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So right now there should be an alarm going off in your head, your conscience, alarming you that this is deadly serious. This is your life that's at stake. It's not just who you're going to marry. It's not what you're going to do for a job. This is your forever. You're going to think about this with a sense of seriousness? Yes, sir. And what about you? I think different than your beliefs. No offense. Yeah. And what about you? Yes, sir. Matthew, what do you disagree with? Because I'm going to plead with you to get right with God because if your eyes meet my eyes on Judgment Day and you're still in your sins, you'll say to me, why didn't you slap my face that day in California? But I can't slap your face. That would offend you. All I can do is slap you with words and say, this is your life. So what part did I mess up on? What don't you agree with? I don't know. I don't agree with such a cruel God. I feel like he's more accepting. But that's just what I think. It, it, it's more of a thing on different beliefs. Do you know what you've just done? What's that? You've just broken the first and the second of the Ten Commandments. Do you know what they are? No, I do not. First is you shall have no other gods before me, and the second is don't make a false god, either with your hands or your mind. I did what you just did before I was a Christian. I created a god in my own image, the place of my imagination. I created a god that's quite happy with sex out of marriage, doesn't mind lying or stealing or blasphemy. But he's a non-existent God, a figment of the imagination that I shaped to serve my sins. The Bible calls that idolatry and says idolaters will not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't put on a parachute filled with holes because that's what it is. It's a false hope. You've got to face the God of the Bible, the God that created the sun. We can't even look at the sun. It's so bright. He created all things and he's to be feared. Let me leave you with what Jesus said. He said, fear not him who has power to kill your body and afterwards do no more. But fear him who has power to kill your body and cast your soul into hell. Fear him. And then he said this, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's better to enter heaven without an eye than go to hell with both of your eyes. For the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. That's the words of Jesus. So I want you to think about that. Think about how you love your sins and how God will change your heart so you love righteousness the moment you repent and trust Christ. Does that make sense? Yes, sir, it does. It's pretty tough stuff, but it's because I care about you I'm saying this. Okay? Yeah, I understand. You going to think about it? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Well, a lot of people will be praying for you because we've all been where you are. You know, right at the moment. You going to think about it? Yes, sir. Okay. Guys, can I give you a book that I've written? Uh, sure. It's called Scientific Facts in the Bible. A hundred reasons to believe the Bible's the word of God. Let me grab it for you. What did you say? I said I loved hearing your thoughts. You loved hearing the thoughts? Yeah. Oh, that's really neat. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if you were to die today and God gave you justice, you'd be damned. You'd end up in hell. There are two things you must do to be saved. You must repent and put your faith entirely in Jesus. When are you going to do that? As soon as possible. Boy, that's a good answer. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. It says now is the accepted hour because you don't know when you're going to die. You know, death could seize upon you and you sleep tonight, God forbid, but it could happen. Would you be embarrassed if I pray with you? No. Okay, let's bow. Father, I thank you for Angie and her open heart for honesty today. I pray she'll think about her secret sins and this day be genuinely sorry and find a place of true repentance because of your mercy and help in her. May she understand your love for her that you expressed in the cross and this day be born again with a new heart, new desires, all because of your kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I give you a little book I wrote? Okay, let me grab it for you. The secular media understands this world's insatiable appetite for anything royal. When they covered the funeral of Queen Elizabeth, millions from around the world tuned in. How much more will they tune into a coronation of a king on May the 6th of this year, as King Charles lays his hand on the Bible and promises to uphold the truths of the Scriptures? all in front of a watching secular audience of millions. This is an incredible opportunity for the gospel. And so we're sending a Living Waters team, along with our television crew, to London to film this once-in-a-lifetime event and to hand out these amazing memorabilia gospel tracts. We've had five million printed, and we will mail to you a thousand free of charge with free shipping 
if you're going to join us in London. Already thousands from around the world have registered to join us. If you can't make it to London and you live in the UK or in Europe, we'll also mail you a thousand of these beautiful tracks free of charge with no charge for shipping. Again, at no cost to you so that you can give these out in your own town or city. We've also printed half a million copies of this 112 page book called Defender of the Faith. If you live in the United States, we will freely send you 600 tracts and 100 copies of this book to give away to the unsaved. It expounds the biblical symbolism used during the church service and springboards into the gospel. You can freely read the book online. When Paul was in Athens, he used Greek poets as a bridge to reach his hearers. We're going to do the same thing with this coronation. So if you'd like to join us in London, or you'd like these free tracks to give out in your town or city, or you'd like to print these tracks in your own language, or you live in Australia or New Zealand, go to livingwaters.com forward slash London for details. You'll also find details about our Living Waters conference in London, about a Facebook page so you can link up with people who are doing this in your area or who are going to London. That's livingwaters.com forward slash London.